able to keep up with all these names showing up, but keep coming. All right, it is officially one o'clock, so we are going to get started. Um, welcome. Today, I hope to walk through what is an inspirational time and a fun time and a journey that we're going to take as we look and see what has happened in the world of branded merch, mostly what has changed in the branded world of branded merch and how that matters to us now. Um, I put this presentation together as kind of a labor of love. And what I've also done is I've invited multiple voices in on the presentation with me. So throughout this presentation, we're going to have some audio clips that we bring in. We're going to have some video clips that we're going to bring in. But I hope by the time that you're done, you're going to see that a lot has changed about our world. So welcome. I'm so glad you're here. One of the things that I enjoy about doing this particular presentation is for my colleagues, for those of you in the business, is that it is so busy right now out there. It is so crazy busy that often we get so busy, we don't see the incredible things that are happening all around us. In fact, what I hope to show you today is the world has changed. The world has changed how they view what we sell. And by the time you're done, I think you'll see this, but I can also attest to the fact that you are too busy to see what's really happening out there in the world. So we're going to pause during this presentation, allow you to stop working in your business and step back and look outside in and work on your business and see what's changed in the world of merch. Because one thing's for sure is that there, the, this thing about expertise, the, the Journal of Consumer Research had this report that talked about how expertise actually kind of dulls the experience we have around products. Um, this can happen to us in the business because we get so involved in so many things. You know, when folks ask you what you do for a living, you have a hard time answering it because you're a supply chain person, you're a merchandiser, you're a salesperson, you're a customer service, you're marketing, you wear so many hats and we have so much expertise that sometimes it dulls our experience. I was down in South Texas in Fort Davis near the border at the second largest telescope in the world in one of the, one of the largest, darkest skies in the world. And I had this incredible experience where around midnight, we went up to one of the tallest mountaintops with an astronomer with a laser pointer, and he started to point out with us the night sky. The interesting thing was by the time we were done with that hour, hour and a half presentation, um, I actually wasn't overwhelmed. He had gotten so close as a scientist that studied so much that I think he'd lost the magic. And so today, what I hope to do is to help us fall back in love again with this medium that we all fell in love in the first place with why we love doing this, the fun about this business, the fun about this industry, and how the market now sees what we do in such a heightened value of what we do. Um, before I get to that, if you're brand new to the business, this might be new news to you. If you're in the business, this isn't going to be news to you. But for the most part, the industry has hovered um, pre-pandemic around $26 billion in revenue, reported numbers from the industry of folks in the business. Prior to the pandemic, the businesses in this industry, distributors or agencies, were split between three different kinds of disciplines. There were e-commerce providers, there were agency style distributors, and then there were kind of what we would call program distributors who did fulfillment and kidding and different things like that. So this is a generality, but those were kind of three neat little buckets that the industry was split up into. But something happened. Pandemic happened, the world closed, and everyone in the industry did what they do exceptionally well. What you did exceptionally well is that you, to use the overused word pivoted, but you also are so resilient, you found all kinds of alternative solutions. Suddenly folks got into PPE. Suddenly folks were kidding and doing fulfillment and doing shops and stores. And so the promotional industry, for the most part, all of those disciplines kind of blurred. And we started doing different things in the business. So what's going to emerge out of this pandemic is going to be fascinating as we all try to mint and coin our businesses differently moving forward. Um, so we as an industry have changed, and I think we have changed forever. I think that's a good thing. But I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that we're building on one hell of a foundation. I love interviewing folks that come into the business that are newcomers to the business, especially those that come from big retail. Kim Boyce with Trimark is one of those voices. And when I asked him, Kim, what she thought of this business walking into it, here's what she had to say. What do you think as you came into this business, this industry then, what is surprisingly efficient? What is, were you surprised that works very well and something we should all double down on? Um, I think there's a couple things and they're all very different. The first thing that I have been amazed by, and I will start with my own company, PCNA, the ability to 
but, you know, best in class decorated product with such a tight turnaround and logistically get it to yeah. in the hands of the end users in a very short amount of time is something that when I was in retail, we would have killed for. Right. Now, I know supply chain problems are really exacerbating your world right now, but to hear an outside perspective come in with huge big box retailer experience and say, wow, this supply chain is amazing. Yes, we do have challenges. Um, in fact, tomorrow, um, Jonathan Isaacson with Gemline will be doing a webinar on supply chain challenges, where we're at now, well, what's happening and where we can expect in the future. I encourage you to go to Gemline's website to check that out. Um, I'll be attending that one as well. But we do have supply chain problems, but I want us to remember that we built on an incredible foundation of an amazing industry that takes the most complex processes and delivers an amazing experience every time. And kudos to our supplier partners who are the heart of this industry and really keep things going. So I just had to say that as we move on. Yes, things were broken in terms of value of our medium and what was happening in the market, but there are a lot of foundational what things do you think that we have done really well. The other thing that's changed is that the market's relationship with our medium has changed forever. And really, this is the best thing that's happened for our business. In fact, one of the articles I wrote that's out on the community.com and skew.com blog site is an article called Nobody Calls It Swag Anymore. What I discovered was um, when you go look at Google Trends um, search results for the phrase promotional products, an interesting thing. When you look back from 2004 to the present, the phrase promotional products has actually been on the decline, according to Google Search Trends report. And of course, Google Trends is showing what folks are searching for. So that's been on the decline. Interesting thing that when you do the same thing with the word swag, when you go back to 2004, you'll see these spikes around 2009, 2010, 2011, but then it also has been in a state of decline. By the way, that number 100 on the left side of your screen doesn't represent the actual numeric value. It just represents the highest number of searches that have happened throughout the years around that time. But look what's happened just with the word merch over the time period since 2004. Um, it's an astounding display of what the market is now referring to in terms of our medium. Now, why does this matter? I mean, is this simple semantics? Is it simple nomenclature? It is, but it also has incredible potential for us. So if the market has changed how it refers to what we sell, this has big implications for our SEO, for our brand identity, and for conversation points with our customers. Um, this also has an impact on the respect our medium carries i.e. cheap giveaways, or is it merch? Which you'll find out by the time we're done with this presentation, the merch has a really cool connotation to it. Um, this also has implications for attracting top creative and sales talent to our organizations. You know, there's kind of a leap they have to make when they come into the industry and they're not familiar with the business. They hear the term promotional products, they hear you can do awards, hats, jackets, pens, you can do all of these things. What does that really mean? It's confusing but they can attach to this word branded merch because in their consumer experience, they have had an emotional experience with that. Um, that. And then also for how our new team members connect with the medium they already embrace, it helps them fast ramp a lot quicker. And finally, it's, it's also about how you and I see the market in terms of it being finite or being infinite. And I'll show you what I mean by the end of the presentation when I talk about that. Um, also, what has changed is the buyer themselves. The buyer themselves, the differentiation between B2C and B2B has actually disappeared. Um, it, you're seeing at least, at the very least, it's blurred. And this is according to Forrester. In fact, Forrester came up with the term that they now call the business consumer because the B2B buyer is now bringing all their preferences, all their tastes, all their predilections into their buying process. Now, that's always happened in the past. What we're seeing is this amplification of their experience on the consumer side that they're bringing in. This has huge implications for not only the merchandise that we sell that's fashion forward, that's, that's relevant to today, but also the systems by which they buy and how they buy through us. So let's look a little bit at how the world once views swag. Now, you might be familiar with this because um, you've seen articles like this and maybe it, maybe it um, hits you the wrong way like it would many folks, but you've seen articles like this in the past um, where you see the article from the New York Times about the cotton tote crisis or you see the Fast Company article about it's time to stop spending billions on cheap conference swag. If you're new, maybe you haven't seen these, but these have proliferated over the past, probably pre-pandemic years, you started to see um, an increase in these types of articles. And they would often refer to what we sell as you know, those um, in the pejorative, cheap plastic stuff, 
tchotchkes, giveaways, freebies. But really what I want you to pay attention to now, we focus as an industry too much on the negative news. What I want to show you is what's happened. By the way, we had the um, author of the Fast Company article on a podcast and at SKUCon one, one year. So you're welcome to go check that out and listen to that entire conversation. But here's what I'd prefer you do. To start opening your eyes to what's actually happening in the market and what's happening with this medium. In fact, you're going to see articles now, you're seeing articles like this all the time. Um, if you notice branded merch everywhere, you are not alone. Here's why. How Supreme Style Merch Drops took over corporate America. What's driving the merch opportunity at restaurants? You're seeing things like Kanye's Donda event. Now, I know it's Kanye, but it broke records for the highest grossing U.S. tour based solely off its merch sales. Now, there, there's a connection here between branded merch, which is no different than band merch, between consumer merch, restaurants, high fashion. You'll see these connections by the time that we're done. Um, but what I what it really opened my eyes was that I had journalist Adam Bluestein on the SKUcast talk about the article he wrote called How Supreme Style Merch Drops Took Over Corporate America. Now, the backstory is, um, Adam has written for all kinds of articles. Um, he has written uh, magazines. He's written for Men's Journal. He's written for a lot of scientific uh, journals, actually. So he has this incredible research mind. And I ask him, uh, because his, his article was so dense and it was so amazing, I said, how many hours did you spend researching this industry? And he said, uh, I spent about 100 hours looking at this. And he laughed because it, um, he thought it was funny and also a lot of fun. But here's what Adam had to say when I asked him about this. What was your thoughts as you were uncovering this? Just, you know, amazement at, at how much of it there was. <laughs> the more I dug, the more I found. So um, Taco Bell was was early on this. Yeah. Popeyes had a big drop um, last year. Um, sold out a run of basically staff uniforms, right? That they were selling. Nice <laughs> right. Branded right. merchandise. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think <laughs> talking to people, it seems like it was a way to connect and a unique, yeah. a unique way to connect through merchandise that you're not even getting through social media. So, um, um, I, I love what Adam said here that it was a unique way to connect through merchandise that they are not even getting through social media, that they're not even getting through social media. What a great uh, analogy. And by the way, Adam interviewed all kinds of folks. He interviewed in clients with this, he interviewed in, in recipients, he interviewed all of those in the merch business. So it was a fascinating article. You can check it out later when you have some time. But this really opened my eyes because I began to see more and more articles in the positive. And this kind of craziness we have seen for a while. Now, the first time I, I, I know Adam mentioned this, the Kentucky Fried Chicken Crocs, I thought, what is happening out there? Um, not only that, you're seeing this happen, happen with so many big brands. Um, I mean, when Aldi's dropped a merch collection, Aldi's the discount grocery store dropped a merch collection. Um, and finally, when I saw that recently that the Queen had dropped a merch collection, um, then I, I had to realize and ask, what the hell is going on? Uh, there's something really cool happening in the world of merch and we'll unpack this more as we go along, but it's not just um, affecting the uh, low end of the consumer food chain, if you will, or affecting um, the media brands. Um, it's also impacting high fashion as well, which I'll touch on in a minute, but, and also um, fashion brands like Balenciaga. In fact, right now, and this is how, amazing what's happened with the perception of merchandise is that right now, if you wanted the Fortnite Balenciaga hoodie, you could go over and buy it right now for a cool $725, but maybe you're cheap and you don't want to spend that kind of money on a hoodie. I understand you can save a few bucks and get the t-shirt for $475. So there's something amazing that's happening out there in the world. In fact, it's safe to say merch is kind of having a moment. Um, now, those of us that have been doing this for a while realize that this moment is a long time coming. And honestly, this moment has been happening through the years off and on. It's just the market is now really catching up to the possibility and the capabilities of the medium. And they're really doing some special things with it. So how the world now views merch is a completely different way. Merch has become synonymous with products that people will pay a premium for. It creates skyrocket demand, scarcity, radical brand love, allowing individual expression, and it allows us to build bonds of tribal identity, which I'll demonstrate here in a minute. So the old swag was stuff we all get. 
The new merch is all about the gear that we covet, the gear we covet and the stuff you love. Branded merch is really no longer about simply advertising. It's no longer about advertising. It is that but it's about so much more. So here are seven new paradigms that sort of reshape the future of branded merch as you and I work in it now. Number one, one of the biggest paradigms I see happening with merchandise is the merch is the new press release. It's the new instigator and the provocateur. Um, when Diego Monroy tweeted out and asked the question, why does Tesla not advertise? Elon Musk replied, I hate advertising, but you know what Elon Musk loves? What Elon Musk loves is merch. In fact, when he said he was thinking about starting a new university, the Texas Institute of Technology and Science, his first reply to his own tweet, of course, was it will have epic merch. We've seen what Elon has done with merch through uh, different fiascos that he's created around the truck. Some of you might remember the truck with the smashed window. He created a commemorative t-shirt to represent that failure. Recently, or last year, I think it was, he, um, in, in order to sort of provoke uh, the, the stock market, folks were selling Tesla stock short. He came up with his own pair of sexy satin red shorts to poke fun at it and have fun with this. So Elon is using merch in a really, really unique way. In fact, um, in January, what he announced was if you could now buy Tesla merch with Dogecoin. So he's stepping in on the Bitcoin game, the Dogecoin game, and uh, really setting the bar and using merch in a different way. And again, he's using merch as a press release, as a way to communicate with the public, as a way to make a connection, and as a way to provoke a conversation out there. It's a fascinating way to look at it. Um, Panera, Bread, when they wanted to increase their soup sales in the summer, they didn't like arm their salespeople with new sales techniques. What they did instead was said, why don't we just create a swimwear line that celebrates soup? So you, of course, could float in your own pool in your own um, inflatable um, that looks like a bread bowl. How well did that go? Well, the Panera Swim Soup collection was already selling out by the time it's, other publications started catching on to it. So again, it's a press release moment. It's a way to instigate, create, provoke, inspire, and, and really sort of um, inside a conversation. Um, this is also being used um, on both sides of the aisle. In fact, last week, I'll let you dig into the details because I'm not going to weigh in on, on, on this and, and either side. Um, Hillary Clinton sent out this tweet that said, you can take a sip from your new mug as you read the news. Um, also, on the other side of the aisle, of course, uh, what's been making headlines over the past week is Josh Hawley's campaign merch that supposedly featured his uh, fist bump to January 6 riders. Um, again, not taking a position. What I am trying to show you, though, is that merch has become a way to, to create a conversation and inspire a conversation or provoke a conversation. This technique is being used quite a bit. I think it's an amazing technique that's happened. This isn't new, though, by the way. Folks have been using merch for years. Uh, we know when you go back, some of the most famous merchandise, when you look um, back at the 60s, um, the Vietnam War, the future is female, uh, merch has always been used as a statement-making device. It's just now we are seeing this in the hands, uh, I think, of the average consumer, and we're seeing this in the hands of any brand can use and make a statement. Um, but remember that our medium has always been that radical medium that had a, a democratized voice that can reach everyone. All right, number two, the other way that we see merch really transforming the world and setting sort of a new paradigm is that merch creates cult-like fervor in followers and forging this tribal identity. Um, Sally Rooney is one of the most successful authors today. In fact, when she was about to release her, her book, A Beautiful World, Where Are You? They sent out this kit to influencers ahead of time and it just sort of um, uh, fired up the literary internet as people began really talking about these bucket hats. And so th this, again, is another way that merch is entering the conversation in a very special and tactile way. And my point in bringing this up too is that it's not just fast food brands, it's not just um, tech brands, but it's also authors and many, many people are getting on the game. In fact, what you'll notice now is that merch has become so important for films and movies and shows that we binge watch that um, they have to be careful not to release spoilers on their merch. And some of them are actually doing this tactically, using merch as a way to leak a little bit of a spoiler. Um, you'll see this on the Stranger Things season four merch, hints at what's to come regarding the Creel family storyline. Um, there have been some anime projects, big anime projects that have been re released recently 
that actually uh, had spoilers on their merch um, before uh, fans, as fans discovered it. So another interesting way that folks are using merch in a, in a very high profile way, but also in a subtle sort of undercover way, which is kind of rad. Um, books are now being written about merch. And these are just two examples, but two of my favorite examples. Um, cult writer, uh, Japanese writer, Hiroki Murakami, if you're not familiar with his work, I highly recommend his work. He's amazing. Um, and his book, uh, the t-shirts I love simply a book about the t-shirts in his closet. I kid you not, but it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I sent this copy to Mark Graham, um, as, as well. It's a lot of fun, but also the book for promotional use only is a book released by a 24 films. Many of you love a 24 films. And if you don't have this book in your distributorship and your agency and your supplier, everyone should have this book at, at their hands. Cause it really shows you what fun can happen with the merch that we sell. And this goes back to films that have been made over the past 20, 30 years and how they use merchandise for their, um, for their kits and their influencer kits long before we called them influencer kits. But what I love about it, there's some kind of boring merch that when you tie it in with the right movie, it just really makes magic happen. So books are now being written about merch. That's a brand new thing and, and probably a sign of more to come. The other thing that's kind of happening is that we're seeing the world of high fashion streetwear, branded merch, um, and Local aesthetics, I don't know if, if that's the only word I can think of, is aesthetics blend together in this really interesting amalgamation of, of uh, advertising. Um, in fact, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, there's such a thing as cabin core or cottage core, the kind of uh, apparel you would wear. And what Marion Park said that what's important to note about the abundance of micro cores is the greater movement in youth culture towards niche aesthetics and subcultures. So this is all about framing tribal identity. In fact, what you and I have done with merchandise for corporations and for businesses in the past, for employee programs, has all been about doing the same thing, forming this tribal identity around a particular brand. But that's kind of what's happening and a little bit of a flint to the fire um, with branded merch as well. In fact, um, when you go back to norm core, cottage core, goblin core, whatever you want to call it, whatever the next aesthetic is, um, there's an article that was produced in the cut that our friend Danny Rosen sent me that I absolutely love about Zismocore. Now, Dr. Zismore, as I's more, if you're from New York, you'll correct me, um, was a, a doctor who had ads all over New York City. And the article was all about this hyper local trend of wearing branded merch. And I love this quote on a Zoom recently. A friend who definitely doesn't follow fashion mentioned that he had been out buying pita bread and found himself momentarily paralyzed while looking at something pinned to the wall of the market, unable to answer a question in his head. Why do I covet this not particularly attractive t shirt from Sahadi's? Brilliant, brilliant writing, brilliant, brilliant quote. And it really sums up something that's happening, what I would call local core. And what we've been doing as an industry for a while, but we've never had the coinage around it. We've never had the language around it. We've never really gone out to the market and inspired this kind of thing in the local cities and where we're at. Uh, Zizma Core, as the cut coined it back in March, embraces hyper locality, whether that's a Gnome tea or a G-Line cap from Curbed Magazine. So you go back to these aesthetics from village core to prairie core, all the way to Zizma core. There's some interesting things happen that, that can on the creative side um, with you and your clients and their locality or where they're at. There's some magic that can really happen. The other thing that's happening with merch that I don't think we've ever seen on this scale and Duncan does it incredibly well is that Duncan has become a part of folks identity, who they are, what they enjoy, what they love and how they love to express what they love. Tell me you love Duncan without telling me you, you love Duncan. And the quote from this Welcome to Duncan World article that I love is that they were, they were highlighting Frances, who was one of the customers who was showing in her merch. And I think she had this whole thing backstory with her wedding and things like that. But what they said was loving, loving Duncan is a part of Frances' identity. It's just a part of her story, her personal story. So this is about individual identity. It's about um, aligning with a tribe and unity and all of those things. In fact, now what's fascinating to me about being in the merch business for all of these years is I don't know that I've ever seen quite the zeitgeist around merch that I have like this, but also the, what used to happen is once upon a time, um, clients would say, you know, we should probably do some merch now. The most progressive brands, the most relevant brands um, are actually um, 
they better come to the table with a strong merge game. That's the bottom line. And so with you and your clients and with you and your customers, it's no longer about, oh, I guess we should get. It's a proactive priority for the brand. You'll see this with some of the largest consumer brands that are happening. The merch is no longer, uh, oh, by the way, maybe we should think about that. Because if that happens, this is exactly what will transpire, is that fans will notice that. There's not enough Luisa merch. If you haven't seen Encanto, it's, it's amazing. Um, there's not much Luisa merch out there, and they called them on. So the merch game now had better be strong and it better be a priority. So what's happening in the market is we're seeing this golden age of individual expression and a great hunger for connection and belonging. All right, number three, merch is an emotional connection and conversation point. It's an emotional connection and conversation point. I don't know how many of you know this, but when Yeti first started selling coolers in the first few years, every cooler that was shipped, the founders threw in a Yeti hat and a t-shirt. Why? According to the article Inc., to create a conversation around the product create a conversation around the product. We ask ourselves, why did a, why did a cooler 10 times the price of the average cooler suddenly outmarket everyone else? What well, began with these grassroots, I think rebellious attitude that we were going to, we are going to create a brand experience around Yeti. And did they ever, by the way, if you haven't seen the videos around Yeti and what they do in terms of their stories and customer stories and beautiful work, but it started at the beginning and it started with merch creating that connection and those conversation points. I love this quote from the CEO of PF Chang's who said that uh, they recently launched their own shop for PF Chang's gear. And he said, we know that consumers are looking to connect with brands on a more experiential level. And we are launching pfcshop.com to meet that demand and integrate into their lifestyle in a new and meaningful way. There again, merch is no longer taking a backseat. Merch has now come to the front. Um, Tesla, uh, of course, all of, of what Elon does, whether it's for SpaceX or Tesla, the merchandise game is so incredibly strong. And you'll notice that with the Tesla merch, the merch and the aesthetic really fits the colorways, the quietness, the sophistication and simplicity of the Tesla brand. Um, I got to experience this first time, firsthand when we had a multi-billion dollar customer, uh, multi-million dollar customer who actually bought um, around three to $5 million worth of merch a year. And the CEO for the longest time himself had to sign off on the merch because it was so close to the brand experience and he wanted that impact and he knew it was important. Um, so you'll see that um, brands like Tesla, brands like SpaceX, um, it's a reflection of their brand. It's not to no longer just an, oh, by the way, we should have that. It's a very, very important part in the aesthetic and the feel and everything about it uh, fits that. Don't get me going too far down that path. There's so much time we could spend camping around, around the practicalities of that. All right, number four, the fourth paradigm that we're seeing changing in the world of merch is that merch is the new affordable luxury. Um, probably the most famous example uh, around merch is the New Yorker tote bag. Now, the New Yorker tote bag, uh, for some, from us, some of us uh, that are huge New Yorker fans, it's just a must. And some of us are so bougie, we actually had to go get the new color of the New Yorker tote bag just so we could have it. And I'm a hard audience to please because I've seen a lot of merch through the years. But check out what uh, Sam Wolfson said. This is a brilliant copy that uh, Sam uh, wrote. Uh, Michelle, you may have to hire this copywriter. Um, he wrote this, that the famous tote bag company, The New Yorker, has become so successful that they now also produce a weekly magazine filled with investigative journalism, restaurant reviews, and satirical essays. The bag remains its flagship and most popular product, which is somewhat surprising because it's not that good, is it? It's just the logo within the logo. I just, I just, I don't know why I enjoy that so much, but I love that so much. Um, but we all know that they have sold millions of these New Yorker tote bags and all over the world, and they've become a phenomenon. In fact, the New York Times, having written the cotton tote crisis, um, ironically, has um, not one, not two, not three, not four, but 14 different tote bags in their shop. So interesting thing that's happened in the world of uh, big media and merchandise. The other thing that's happening in the world of just hotel merchandise, this article came out in January in Vogue about welcome to the era of cult hotel merchandise. So we can learn a lot from the things that are happening in the high-end hotel world um, uh, in terms of merchandise because uh, Ritz Carlton has really not done hardly any collaborations in the past. And they suddenly did these amazing collaborations with uh, incredible merchandise that you'll see with the jackets there and the water bottles. But this whole thing is not affecting just the fast food brands. I hope you'll be able to see that this is happening to brands all over. In fact, in one fashion magazine, I love the quote in here that said, uh, merch is the new black. But the question is, is merch the new luxury? 
And for all brands, this happened to me. I was down in South Texas, down in Marfa, Texas, and I was at Cobra Rock, this famous boot company. I was really eyeing these $700 boots that I couldn't afford to buy. And I thought, um, you know what? I can't buy the boots, but damn right, I'm going to get that t-shirt. Uh, so it's interesting, the alternatives that are happening with the merch too. The, uh, a lot of brands, you notice that everyone's got merch now. And it's a great way to still create a connection for the brand and sort of stay plugged in with the brand as well. Now I'm preaching to the choir. I know you guys know that, but if you're new to the business, this is probably some good information for you. Okay, number five, the other paradigm that we're seeing really shift and how the world is changing, how they look at merchandise and how we sell merchandise and how we use merchandise. This is a first that I can recall, but merch is now leading trends. Merch is now creating trends versus following trends. If you've been in the industry a while, you'll know that we used to fall behind fashion trends about five years or so, give or take, but we we're always behind the eight ball. Then through the years though, big name brands started coming in um, and uh, big well-known fashion brands started coming in that started to change the conversation, but also everything accelerated through the pandemic. Um, I mentioned the B2B, B2C lines had blurred, but merch now is no longer just following what's happening in the market. It's a driving trends that's happening in the market. I think one of the, one of the best examples of this is that um, when White Castle wanted to commemorate their 100-year anniversary, they reached out to one of the most uh, exceptional and renowned fashion designers, Telfar Clemens, to design their staff uniforms. And their staff uniforms just went crazy. It was a really brilliant concept um, it, they were unisex uniforms that were uh, just a, a great way to celebrate the brand. Um, and also you're seeing in terms of band merch, you're seeing the different brands that are elevating the experience and creating a democratized voice around the type of merchandise we buy and how it reflects our unique individual individuality. So some really fascinating things happen in terms of high fashion and brands that we love and adore. Um, one last, last thing, um, Kate Mazewich, our vice president of marketing, we were just on a, a team, man, team management call and Kate held up her Biebs, um beanie. I don't know how to call them. I'm always like feeling I'm sacrilegious to my Canadian friends by calling it the wrong thing, the toque, the beanie, the hat. But um, she actually has one of the, uh, the Bieber products. But this collaboration came out and and if you're, you're those of us in the US, we don't realize Tim Hortons is, is like this massive chain that's everywhere. Everybody was just kind of freaking out, like, is this for real? Is this a parody? But nope, it's absolutely true. And, and not only that, but the merchandise sold out so quickly and it's so coveted, they can hardly keep it in stock. So it's fascinating what's happening in that world. Now I'm going back to Zizmacore and local core, all of these trends, all of these things happening, you can create with your customers as well. It's really not a question of just those big name brands anymore. You can create this kind of expectation around these audiences. Okay, one more paradigm that's really uh, changing is number six. Branded merch now falls under a much bigger umbrella called brand expression. Something happened through the pandemic is that I saw many of my most, um, my closest distributor agency type friends or, or distributor friends evolve into doing all kinds of things outside of their scope. In fact, I see more and more distributors getting somewhat product agnostic. You used to be able to say, well, we don't do print, but we do promo. But suddenly you're doing kitting and you're doing kit, print, and promo. Or we don't do this or we don't do that. Instead, what you're seeing is that if it falls under the umbrella of branded expression or brand expression, then it's something that distributors everywhere are considering. Our friends at Juice, uh, Lee Fine and Robert Lederman, Juice Marketing Leader, this amazing agency up in Seattle, where they're actually all over, um, that we recorded an episode about how they view opportunities. They actually have this uh, opportunity where they're going to, for a large customer, going in and do the, the um, design and styling for a lot of their uh, offices, which is quite a departure from branded merchandise in general. So we're seeing a lot of openness toward what we do moving forward as an industry and how open we should remain to opportunities. And in fact, uh, one of the best presentations delivered uh, at SKUCon in January was written by our friend Ben with uh, Advocate, who talked about uh, experiential marketing and how it unlocks secrets to growth. It's a brilliant video because he goes into the NFTs and a lot of things they've done in virtual reality space. Um, but they uh, were an experiential marketing company who got into the promotional products business. And all of those things now become a part of the same experience. 
our friends that at the PSDA that used to be the, the, the print services distribution association became brand chain because they too recognized that the market has changed and that a lot of things now fall under brand expression as opposed to just print and just the discipline of print. And the one I want to show you, and we'll listen to a clip from this now, is last week I had the privilege of recording with Michael Scott Cohen, the co-founder of Harper & Scott. Many of you might have seen the press release that they released, how they created a new metaverse division. What I loved about my conversation, it was an amazing conversation. We'll publish this next week on the SKUcast. What I loved is what Michael had to say about sort of this openness and how it wasn't a departure from what they do as a branded emergency agency. Here's the clip. And we could take our client's brand from the tangible space and replicate it in the digital world, not just for a new revenue stream for them, but a lot of what we work on are loyalty programs and to build that community for them or to help grow that community in the digital sphere was really impactful. And so when I spoke to that company on Monday morning at 9 a.m., they said, you're the third agency in the last two weeks that, that pitched us on, a, on an NFT project. And they said, if we do this, we would do it with you guys because it makes sense, because you're already doing the t-shirt for us. So having that one for one copy in the Metasphere, in this case, it was Decentraland, makes complete sense. Makes complete sense. Not a departure at all. Something that I loved also that I took from Michael Scott Cohen was this very attitude of brand expression and being open to what we do for clients. Um, uh, and boy, we should all keep our eyes out on, on the metaverse and what's happening in that world because there's interesting opportunities for those of us in the brand and merch business. All right, number seven, merch is a one-to-one -one medium to drive social impact. This has also been a huge paradigm change um, for the industry. And I'll show you by example. Um, many of you know we had David Smith speak um, at a SKUCon, and I've had the privilege of interviewing Davis. This is a video we've never shown, but it's uh, me and Davis having a podcast interview around um, the products they produce. And, and I know many of you are familiar with Cotopaxi. If you don't know the backstory, it's an incredible backstory, an incredibly generous um, spirit that exudes at Cotopaxi that comes from the founder, but they're doing some amazing work with supply chain and how they are impacting the lives throughout supply chain. Um, and I asked Davis about this because it was a, a phrase that I had never heard of before. But here's my really brief clip from my chat with Davis about this phrase that I think is magical for our industry. I, I think one um, very instructional part of the, the way you've built your business is around product design and supply chain philanthropy. And one part of Cotopaxi's mission is this. Can you explain what I, what that phrase means, supply chain philanthropy, and, and how it helps throughout the supply chain? Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, this is a great question, Bobby. So I think, I think one of the ways, the most obvious way that people think about businesses doing good is giving away profits. It's giving mm -hmm. away their money to go help in the world in some way. And that's certainly a, an important part of it. But for us, it just felt it would, it would feel disingenuous if we were saying we're going to go help fight poverty if in, within our own supply chain, the people touching our own product were living in poverty. You know, yeah. we needed to make sure that wasn't the case. And so, uh, you know, we've invested a lot into our supply chain, making sure that we're using partners that are aligned with our values. Uh, you know, we use a number of fair trade factories. We've gone into factories and and, you know, we don't have we don't have anything prescriptive. It's not like we come in and say, OK, you have to do this. You have to do that. We come in and listen and we ask questions and we find opportunities to have an impact in each community. So, you know, one of our factories, we we invested in building a community garden uh, where the factory workers could take fruits and vegetables back home to their families every night. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, we have another factory where we started. We empowered the sewers to go design their own bags using remnant materials instead of telling them what to sew they could be creative themselves and so you know every factory has unique challenges and unique opportunities and so we try to understand those and uh it's really amazing the impact that you can have on so many people just by working in your supply chain to be more ethical instead of just yeah. driving down price to the half penny which it, people do uh, we're not as concerned about that it's like let's pay fair wages let's pay the factory fair prices for what we're going to make. And I love that. And, and many in this industry are doing this. In fact, um, 
Um, uh, 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 one of my favorite stories, I have to just tell you this, and we're going to do a live unboxing right now of this project, but yesterday about three or four o'clock, but before I leave Cotopaxi, I have to say, you need to go check out that interview with Davis Smith. Um, he also did an interview on how I built this. So there's a couple of interviews out there. The one I have on the SKUcast, we cover all kinds of things in a really short amount of time, but it's an amazing story. I encourage you to check it out and listen to it. And I hope you are um, featuring Cotopaxi products with your customers. But um, yesterday, about three or four o'clock, I was you know putting together this presentation. And on Instagram, I see that Thumbprint produced this brilliant campaign. So I grabbed a link from that. I sent a text to Brian Gill, the chief experience officer. I said, hey, man, can I, can I get the, the raw file for this video so I can embed it in my presentation? And he said, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to send you this campaign. So here we go, a live unboxing. Now, here's why I'm bringing, I'm gonna, I have a point in making, attaching this with the Code Epoxy story because it relates. Uh, but I wanted to open this box sort of live on air. Don't do this at home. Um, but I want to show you this amazing box from Thumbprint. Here's the packaging and here's the design. On Here on one side, it says, handmade with love just for you. Now this campaign happened so fast for me um, like it just, like I said, just yesterday to this morning, um, that I didn't get the full details except for I know that it was a campaign they released around Valentine's Day, and I know what the intent was when I show you the next video that you'll see. So um, let's see what's inside here. Sorry, you can't have see the whole experience as I unbox this. Oh my God, this is beautiful. Can you guys see, can you even see, or can you see just the screen? Cause that I'm looking at the chat. All right. All right. We can see you. Okay, great. I, I got some, so, so you can see this beautiful alpaca blanket. It's absolutely gorgeous actually. And so when you go in here into the tag, you'll see the thumbprint logo here. And as I understand it, there's a QR code in here on the printed piece. And, um, some folks can see me, some folks can't, um, but you can go out to Thumbprint and go, go to Thumbprint to check out their um, Instagram and their marketing and you'll be able to see the campaign I'm talking about. I'm gonna show you the video here in just a minute, but here's a beautiful card that says this Valentine's Day, we wanna show you our appreciation and share the love with some of our most vulnerable populations. Now, I, I did all this um, to get to a point. My point is I wanted to show you the video they created and who they are partnering with and how, how they are making an impact with the merch that they buy and sell. All right, if you didn't see my unboxing, that's okay. Because the most special part, I think, of for our presentation purposes today is to see the impact they're making on community. So my kudos to Brian and Thumbprint, the whole gang. They're doing such amazing work out there. But go out to their marketing, and you'll see um, you'll see more of what what I'm referring to uh, in terms of what they're doing. Um, it, just go to their Instagram, go to their website, go to Twitter. You'll find out because they're brilliant marketers. All right, love my friends at Thumbprint. Um, okay. The other thing I want to show you too, we're talking about impact. This last week or probably two weeks ago was released one of the most beautiful shops I've ever seen. Now, for those that don't know me, um, I, for uh, about 15 years, I was the CEO of a company that specialized in shops and e-commerce and fulfillment. And we did lots of company stores. And so I have seen probably far more than the average bear, lots of merchandise experiences. Well, last week or two weeks ago, UPS um, launched a new shop called Be Unstoppable Gear. And um, this is their first time to sponsor New York Fashion Week. And this is their first ever limited edition collection that's making its debut at New York, New York Fashion Week 
Um, and 100% of the proceeds will help support up and coming black designers. So again, a new, this new paradigm that's sort of happening around merch from supply chain philanthropy and how we're buying merch to the causes that we're supporting and creating special experiences around building that. So it's an amazing thing that's happening around merch. I think it's a brilliant example. And by the way, all these examples that I showed with you, I hope you're showing these to your client because there's no better way than to point at what some of the leaders in the space are doing than to help them understand that they too need to make merch a priority and not an afterthought. Okay, final thoughts on this. Every brand wants to be a lifestyle brand. Every brand does for their tribe, their community, their fans, employees. Am I saying that every single brand wants to be worldwide famous? No, what I'm saying is they want to be a lifestyle brand for their particular tribe, for their community, for their fans and employees. Um, when we were doing company stores, we had to change the language we were using with customers because it was very uh, technical and functional. And it was around fulfillment and kidding and all of these different disciplines that we needed to be masters at, but the customer didn't need that jargon up in their head. What they actually needed to know is that everything that we were doing was cultivating brand champions. We we're cultivating this experience for them around their brand. And that's the language that we needed to get a hold of. Every brand wants to be a lifestyle brand. In fact, what you're seeing happen now with merch and e-commerce and shops in particular, is this attempt for every brand to be a lifestyle brand from Netflix and chill to, um, to Whataburgers. And I don't know who's doing the Whataburger store. I'm going to find out who you are because you were doing brilliant work. Um, and if you're not down in the South, down here in Texas area, down in my part of the country, you don't realize what a phenomenal Whataburger is in this part of the country. Um, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous and people love their Whataburger and their merchandise shows it. One of the coolest merch shops I've seen, and it's for a burger fast food chain. It's a really cool experience. Go there, take some lessons. And also the Chipotle merch is doing some brilliant jobs. Again, every brand wants to create this experience on behalf of their users. Every brand wants to become this. You even notice with big brands like Gloss, Glossier um, are building brands within a brand just based around their merch. They have glossy wear that you can use. So every brand really desires to be a band. Every single brand desires to be a brand or it should aspire to be a band. And I think it's a great thought experience for you and your team as you think through brands and you think, um, how can we think differently about this company, about this company we're working for, or even our own brand and think it through the lens of a brand. I think it's a great thought experience that you should do sometime. All right. Back to something I mentioned very early on is that merch has now become synonymous with products that people will pay a premium for creating skyrocket demand, scarcity, radical brand love, allowing an individual expression and building bonds of tribal unity. So merch is no longer simply advertising. The points that we covered today is that merch is the new press release, the instigator and the provocateur. Merch creates cult-like fervor and followers forging tribal identity. Merch is an emotional connection point and a conversation point. Merch is the new affordable luxury. Merch is now leading trends, actually creating trends versus just following. Merch now falls under a much bigger umbrella brand expression. Finally, um, just a random thought that I have is that merch, in many cases, if you're a B2B service company, you don't have a tangible product that you sell. Merch is a concrete symbol of the abstract band ex brand experience. Merch is a concrete symbol of the abstract brand experience, which is a real powerful way to look at it. All right, so the $500 billion question, I changed this because I think we tend to see the industry through lenses um, that might be smaller than the world of branded merch. The real question is, how do we see ourselves today? How do you see yourself? How do you see your companies today? Uh, this was recently published by PPAI, um, an article called uh, Corporate Gifting Market, maybe much larger than previously known. When you look at just the corporate gifting market and what's happened, it's been on the rise, um, uh, supposedly going to hit the two, 300 billion mark. By, two, by 2024, um, global TV and movie merch poised to grow by 79 billion. I mean, again, when you consider the perspective and the opportunity that exists for you and I, it's amazing. And about a decade ago, maybe five, maybe even five to seven years ago, the examples I showed you would have been merch done by people outside of the industry. 
That's no longer the case. In fact, many of the examples that I showed you here are being done by folks within the industry, some of which I know about, and uh, I, I can't necessarily divulge all the details. But um, but merch is being done. This incredible merch is being done by folks within the industry. Okay. The the last thing I want to share with you is if the world has changed how it perceives merch going forward, and if these new new paradigms are happening then there's something also that needs to happen differently with our brands moving forward. We need to be changing the way we go to market. We need to be changing the way we talk with customers. We need to be changing the way that we present ourselves and what we sell. I'll be doing a talk next week at um, PPAI's Direct to You, the virtual conference. Um, so if you want to go check that out on PPAI's website, I'm going to actually drill down into how we need to be repositioning our brands. Some of the stuff I'll be sharing is similar to what I've shared with you today. The difference is I'm going to talk about how we need to position our brands for this opportunity moving forward. Um, but think about companies like Apple. When you ask what Apple really does, they sell phones, they sell technology products, but really what Apple does, they exist to empower creative exploration and self-expression. That's what Apple does. Brands like Starbucks, does Starbucks just sell coffee? Starbucks sells coffee, yes. But if you haven't read um, the founder's book, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's called Onward, I believe. Um, it's, it's an incredible um, story about them and their journey. But when you think about coffee, coffee is one of the oldest commodities in, in the world. And yet Starbucks is taking this and we are paying a premium, four, five, six, 10 times the cost of what a normal cup of coffee would be by going to Starbucks. What does Starbucks actually do? Starbucks exists to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. I love that mission. And again, what I'm getting at here is if the world has changed how it perceives what we sell, then we need to be going to market differently. What does Best Buy do? You could argue that Best Buy is this huge chain that sells boxes within in boxes, technology products, computers. They're actually selling competitors' product inside under their own roof. Um, it's a strange business model, but here's what I love about Best Buy. And I read this great article the CEO talked about. Best Buy exists to enrich their customers' lives through technology. And finally, maybe an example closer to home, um, and I reached out to our friends at Sanmar to see if I could show this, but Sanmar exists to create meaningful connections that elevate lives. And I think the video that I'm going to show you now sums up everything that I've been talking about so beautifully well that I thought we'd take just a minute and see what we mean. I love that because it's no longer just about a t-shirt. Final thoughts, thoughtless selling merchandise, selling thoughtless merchandise is really, really easy. But making intentional merch memorable, collectible, keepable is really hard work. It feels hard if you stopped in the middle of your day to come join this, um, I think, celebration of what Brandon Merch can do, then you know it's, it's really hard work and kudos to you for doing it. And now everyone's favorite part of learning, we're gonna do a little homework. Here's what I wanna ask you. Um, back in the 90s, uh, Cool Mo D created this report card where he was assessing the skills of all his colleagues in the rap industry. And he created his own, um, his own categories around vocabulary, articulation, creativity, originality, versatility, voice, stage presence. And I love that he did this. And you'll see, you know, of course, uh, some of the Snoop got a B plus. Um, who else do we have here? Uh, Puffy got a B. Little Kim got a B. Um, yeah, this is a great way. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do the same thing with you and your brand. Sit around with you and your team and talk about your own branded merch report card. Come up with your own categories and decide what it is, what is it that you do. Here's just a few to think about. Margins. Here's my question for you. Do your margins reflect today's merch madness? 
Are you still selling everything and adding additional services and all the profit that's coming at, coming out of the unit price of the product? Because the market can't bear more and more services coming out the unit price of the product. We need to be charging for our creativity. We need to be charging for our consultation. We need to be charging for those, obviously those kidding services, those shops services, if you're not charging for shops, all those things. If the value of what we sell has reached exponential heights, then ergo should be the value of how we are going to market as well. So do your margins reflect today's merch madness? All right, second, um, design. Is design for you and your team a priority or an afterthought? Because design and everything around is about building a beautiful and exceptional merch experience. See, or the third one, trends. Here's my question to you is not just, are you creating trends? I think the table stakes now are to come to the table and know the trends that are happening around you whether that's through Instagram, TikTok, colleagues on your team that are sort of tasked with knowing what's going on in the world. Um, but are you creating trends? Are you sitting down with your customers and saying, we're not trying to impact the world with your brand. We're trying to impact your world with the brand. And let's create some trends with your brand and have some fun with this. All right. Fourth time, fourth one, ingenuity. Are you creating experiences that no one else can emulate. Now, I've always said we're an ingenious business um, because an ingen ingenuity is about taking a, a product that everyone else can get and then building an experience that no one else can emulate. And the reason you can do that as an agency or a distributor is because no one knows your clients like you. So you can take that same mug that everyone else can get and to you, it's a piece of art because it's a blank canvas and you can create an experience that no one else can emulate because you have the knowledge of what your customer is, what they want to do and their aspirations. So are you creating experiences that no one else can emulate? All right, shops, when it comes to e-commerce, are you selling shirts or creating a fan factory? One of my favorite conversations I've ever had was with an agency um, called Wexley School for Girls out of Seattle. Um, the owner turned to me and said, hey, Bobby, you know what business you're in? And I'm saying, tell me. And he said, uh, you're a fan factory. Well, that was some of the best ways to look at our business uh, that I have ever heard. You're a fan factory. And this is just, just as some examples. Finally, I want to ask you, and I will say it again, services. Are you giving away your creativity, your kidding, your shops, and your consultation? Are you giving away the best part of what you do for free? Because I think it's time that we, we relook at that. Finally, the agency of the future is going to have a few components, I think, that don't exist. This, could, this needs to be a presentation all on its own. But there are four key components that probably could be 12, but I boil these down to four essentials. Number one is folks that understand product as an experience. Like my friends at Thumbprint, like Brian and the team, they understand that product is an experience and they build around that experience. Number two, the beautiful design is not just uh, pretty logos. It's a connection. It's a fire starter. And number three, systems. You, I um, uh, hope you noticed I didn't mention the word common skew once, but here's what I will tell you. According to Forrester, B2B ex buyer expectations are changing. And what they are wanting is they are wanting a seamless experience so that we can focus on the magic of what it is that we're selling. Instead, what you and I are doing, we're spending so many times back and forth on where's my order and doing those kind of logistical things. We're losing sight of the wonder of what we can create. So promo standards and all those things that automate processes, this is not just a common skew plug. What I'm telling you is that the customer is demanding seamless processes so that you and their conversation can be around magical opportunities with merchandise. So systems that elevate the buying experience. All right, finally, you should be leading by example. Just like I showed with our friends at Thumbprint, everyone in this industry should be showing their customers how to do this by creating magical experiences for your merch. Are you creating a brand experience that everyone wants to be a part of? It's my question for you. All right, I'll leave you with this final word. My good friend, Ann Hanley says, good marketing requires fearlessness. So now go create, have fun and go build the future world of Brandon Merch. If you enjoyed this, if you didn't enjoy it, whatever you think, email me, bobby at commonskew.com. You can find me out on the social at Bobby Lehu. I'm so glad you joined us today and I hope it was helpful. So thank you guys for coming. See you soon.